Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship. Whether you are joining us in person or online, we're so glad that you're here. And I want to give a shout out first to Tom Ward, who is manning our live stream this morning. We've had a perfect storm of all of the people that know all the details about running our stream are unavailable today for various reasons. So Tom has stepped up, but if you're online and you're wondering why there aren't also all the fancy camera angles and slides and things, we apologize, but we're super lucky that Tom is here allowing the stream to happen. So thank you, Tom, for that. We are having our congregational meeting following worship down in Fellowship Hall where we will eat together and share a celebration of last year and look ahead to next year. So I really hope you'll join us. If you're not yet comfortable eating together, feel free to just keep your mask on and come on down and just be present with us. Um, we're gonna be thinking together about what we're excited about and where we feel God calling us in the new year. Finally, um, Presbytery Winter Fun Day is next Saturday. If you haven't signed up already, find the details in the bulletin or on the e-news or on the website. Um, this is a repeat from last year. People had a lot of fun. So if you are free, I invite you to come out and be with your fellow Presbyterians. I think that's everything for this morning. So let's just arrive in this space. Take a good deep breath. Lay your troubles down and prepare to worship the living God. Please join me in body or in spirit for the call to worship. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their hearts. Those who do those things shall never be moved. We'll continue with the prayer of the day. Holy God, you call unexpected disciples, those who are poor and meek, those who are hungry and thirsty, those who are rivaled and persecuted, to be a blessing for the world. Number us among those saints that we may serve your purpose and share your blessing, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with you through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.
Please join me in the prayer of confession. Let us confess our sins, for the Holy One delights in blessing those who seek to walk with God. God, we have not done what is blameless and right, nor spoken truth from the heart with love. We do not keep your word, and when we participate in gossip, our words and deeds cause pain. Forgive us by the power of your mercy, that we might stand in goodness of Christ and walk in the light of his love. Let us take a moment now to make our own silent confessions. Sisters and brothers, our sins are forgiven by the faith of Christ, who chose love over hatred and forgiveness over blame. Rejoice and be glad, for God's mercy is great. Jesus brings healing, justice, and peace. Thanks be to God. Our first reading of the word comes from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the case of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With that, shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God?
Good morning. Are there children here today that would like to come and join me? Or anyone young at heart that would like to come and join? You think so? Oh no, here I go. They're already starting. <laughs> All right. I love your little crown we got going on there. We got string. We got hockey players. All kinds of good things we have with us this morning, huh? Well, I have a question. Has, does anyone know what this is? It's a highlighter. That's right, a Sharpie branded highlighter. Um, has anyone used one before? And what do you do with a highlighter? You can write and draw. Outline things, yep. Highlight things, right? It's called a highlighter. You highlight them, but why do we highlight things? Very good. You, you use it to highlight something important that you need to remember. Oh, have you been in a musical before? You're in one now. So you can use it to highlight your music so you know what your part is in the musical, right? When there's all different parts. It's very good. I should save this in my music folder and highlight my music for choir. All right. Um, so yeah, so usually you want to uh, highlight something you want to remember. Like you're, if you're in school and you took some notes on a subject and there's a really important point that the teacher made that you want to make sure that you remember it, right? You can highlight it, right? And so that helps us keep track of the important things. Um, and, and ultimately, I think, you know, what you want to do if you're performing on stage, right, in a play, or if you're in school, you might have a test, right? You highlight the important things so that you can eventually memorize them, right? Yeah. Oh, there's a highlighter tool on the computer. Yeah, when you're doing like, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, you could highlight things on the computer too, right? You don't even need to have one of these. The computers can do anything, huh? Um, so, they, yeah, sometimes they can talk, but yeah, they, yeah. They do, it's kind of a computery voice, we call it, right? So, yeah, so we use this um, to help us remember things and so that we can eventually memorize them, right? And you can do this also with the Bible, right? Now, you can highlight your Bible. I know some people who do. Um, if you do that at home, please ask an adult first before you do it, okay? Make sure there's an adult that's giving you permission. I've already talked to Pastor Laura, so we have permission today. Um, so I'm going to have us uh, highlight a verse in the Bible um, that helps us remember why the Bible is important to us, okay? So we have a Bible up here. It's like the Harry Potter book you're reading. Yes, it is big. All right, so we're going to go all the way over. We're in Micah right now because that's one of our readings today. And another reading is Beatitudes, which is way up here. Um, but we're going to go back here to the Psalms. Woo. Psalm 119. All right, here we go. So the one we're going to the one we're going to highlight is right here, number 105 in Psalm 19. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So that tells us that the Bible is God's word and it helps us remember that God is here for us and we can talk to him and learn from him anytime we read the Bible. It's a very important book for us to remember to use. And I think we should try to memorize this. Um, if we highlight it, and it's important, we should probably try to memorize it. So repeat after me. Your word is a lamp to my feet. And a light to my path. Okay. Do you think you can highlight that for us? Right here. This line. Oh, look at that. It's coming up yellow. And this line. 
the second one, right on where it says, and a light to my path. Very good. See? Look at that. Now, I want you to all remember that tomorrow or, or next year or 20 years from now, when you come back to this church, you're going to be able to flip through the Bible and you're going to be able to see this highlighted verse and remember today and remember what we talked about, how important the Bible is and how much it gives us good information about God, right, and teaches us about God. And pretty cool, huh? And you can do this with your Bible at home for the stuff that you think is very important. All right? So let's try this again for our little prayer here. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Amen. All right, you can go back to your classroom or wherever you're going. Thank you. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew in the fifth chapter, the first 12 verses. Hear the word of God for the people of God. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for us today. As some of you have probably noticed, the last verse from our Hebrew Testament reading today, Micah 6, 8, is the verse that sits under my signature block on my email account. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? I remember the first time I read it, how it leapt off the page for me. Growing up, I never attended Sunday school because it happened during church, and my mother felt that attendance at worship was more important. This meant that I really didn't study the Bible much outside of worship until I was an adult. And so it happened somehow that it was not until I was journeying through a four-year education for ministry program that I really read this verse from Micah. The first year of our curriculum focused on the Old Testament. Every week, we read the next installment of the story of God and God's people, and then met to reflect on what we had read and learned. There was something really powerful for me about reading this story from start to finish, observing the sweep of time and the ebb and flow of God's relationship with God's people, how they leaned into their relationship with Yahweh for a time, only to turn away from God when the world around them became too enticing or they were overcome by outside forces, or they felt that God had abandoned them. There was a richness to the story, a realness that drew me in and made me think that if these imperfect, warring, wayward, faithless, weary, inspiring, creative, joyful people could belong to God, then perhaps I could too. Reading the Bible made me long for a closer relationship with God. I could feel the Holy Spirit enfolding me, and I really wanted to know how to deepen that sense of belonging. 
It was into that context that this simple verse dropped into my faith life. I've been trying to live up to it ever since. As I reflected on it this week, I realized that this verse has really come to dwell in my heart. It is attached to times of joy and sorrow, to life changes and periods of deep discouragement. It feels like an old friend that has journeyed with me for a long way. It has informed how I move through the world and offered guidance when I didn't know what to do. Every once in a while, I think I should choose a new verse, something to spark a new perspective or inform my faith in a new way. But I always return to this one. Three simple commandments that I am sure I will still be trying to follow as I take my last breath. For me, at least, Micah packed a lot into this verse, which is the final word in a sort of courtroom drama that plays out in the passage leading up to this moment. God is charging the Israelites with betraying the covenant they hold with Yahweh. They can offer all the sacrifices in the world, insists Micah, but they mean nothing if they do not follow God's law and keep God's covenant, not only with their creator, but also in their relationships with each other. In this passage, even the earth itself stands as a witness against the sins of God's people. Micah, a contemporary of Isaiah and Hosea, is prophesying at a time when Israel, instead of relying on Yahweh, has formed alliances with Phoenicia and Philistia in an attempt to repel the Assyrians. Wealth has been consolidated so that a vast majority of the resources are held by a tiny minority of Israelites. A shift has occurred from a bartering economy to one based on currency, and this has only served to widen the wealth gap even more. Many of the priests and prophets view their work as a business and not a vocation. Micah reminds the people about all that God has done for them, of their own covenant promises, and of the judgment they face for not living according to these promises. At a time when many are experiencing deepening need, Israel's leaders are attending mostly to their own desires and ambitions. All the while, the threat of a foreign power's military invasion is looming, and the Israelite king is focused on building his own military might. This all sounds oddly familiar, does it not? As people of faith, we commit to following Jesus' commandments to love God and love our neighbor. Yet in our time, too, we see increasing wealth disparities. Leaders who seem more interested in preserving their own power than in doing what is best for the common good, and a military-industrial complex that continues to balloon while our neighbors go hungry, suffer without access to health care, face homelessness, and flee violent living situations. I believe that God calls us today to live up to these same requirements that Micah spoke of to the Israelites of old. What does the Lord require of us? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. The first phrase is perhaps the hardest for many of us. What, I am wondering, did this word justice mean to Micah? In the verses following this one, Micah describes all the wrongs that are happening in his world. Wicked scales and dishonest weights are being used to defraud the poor and enrich those who already have plenty. The wealthy are engaging in violence and speaking lies. The people have followed idols and taken the counsel of false prophets. The faithful have left the land and lie in wait for blood, hunting each other with nets. Officials and judges ask for bribes, and the powerful dictate what they desire. Sons and daughters rise up against their parents, and enemies are members of their own households. For Micah, justice means righting these wrongs, creating economic systems where the poor do not pay extra because the system is biased against them. In our day and age, this might mean making sure there is a large grocery store accessible to every neighborhood so that the poorest of our neighbors don't have to rely on corner stores with hugely inflated prices to buy subpar groceries in the middle of a food desert. For Micah, justice means the powerful not dictating what they want at the expense of the poor. In our time, that might mean advocating for programs that provide affordable housing, a living wage, 
and access to health care over tax cuts for the wealthy. For Micah, justice means not engaging in violence or speaking lies. For us, this might mean promoting peace, even when it appears to go against our selfish interests in a given situation, insisting on an environment that allows all to flourish, even if it means giving up some of our own power or access to yet more wealth. It means putting others' basic needs before our own desires for extras. In our day, justice has become a word loaded with political meaning. Some years ago, I was serving on the outreach team at my church, and we were reviewing a proposal from a local organization. I don't remember anymore what the focus of their work was, but I do recall that they used the word justice three times in their one-page summary of the ministry. The man next to me commented that he thought their work was good, but he really didn't like this word justice. When I asked him to say more about that, inquiring, what does justice mean to you? He said, I think justice means you want to take something away from me and give it to someone else. He did not want to support the project, even though he agreed their work was important, simply because they used this word. Justice does sound scary to many of us, perhaps because of that reasoning. Inside the word lies this idea that someone has been wronged, and it is our duty to make it right. Many of us leap to the conclusion that we will have to give something up to make that happen. And the truth is that we may, in fact, have to do that. In a society that has a deep commitment to individualism and the idea that each of us earns what we deserve and has the same opportunities to do so, this idea of justice sparks a great deal of resistance. But as people of faith, we have committed ourselves to the idea that we will think of others as much as we think of ourselves, and we will concern ourselves with the well-being of our neighbors. Along the way, we can easily forget that we are simply stewards of the gifts God gives us. None of us receives what we have in a vacuum. Certainly, each of us works hard to earn what we have. At the same time, we start with advantages and disadvantages over which we have little control. Did we grow up hungry or well-fed? Did we live in stable housing or move frequently? Did we have access to healthy, affordable food or have to survive on overpriced, heavily processed meals or go hungry? Did we live in a well-funded school district or attend class at a school lacking books and learning materials, adequate staff, and a safe environment? Did we have access to affordable health care or go without because we couldn't afford to see a doctor? Doing justice today does require us to ask hard questions about how we organize ourselves and who is given access to what. Perhaps one fewer astroturf field in one school district could provide enough math textbooks and teachers to fill out a neighboring school system's inadequate resources. Perhaps offering a tax advantage for a grocery store to build in a food desert could be funded by reduced pork barrel projects in the wealthier part of a state. Many of us are good at responding to this prompt to do justice by practicing charity, but we stop short of reaching for justice. What is the difference, you ask? I have heard it described in this way. Imagine you are living by a waterfall with a lovely pool at the bottom of it. One day you come outside to find a small child has been washed over the waterfall and is flailing in the water. Of course you leap in and rescue the child. You give her warm clothes and some hot chocolate and you let the police know that you have found her. This is charity. The next day you come out with your morning coffee and there is another child in the pond. You repeat your actions of the previous day and then continue about your business. But each morning you find yet another child in your pool. Eventually you start investigating what is happening at the top of that waterfall. You begin to ask, why are so many children being washed over it? What is happening here? And you begin to think, what can be done to stop this from happening again? You build a net over the top of the falls. You figure out where the children are falling in in the first place and put up a fence. You go yourself to be with the children and make sure they never leave the bank in the first place. This is justice. 
Justice does require us to engage in personally responding to the broken places in the world where some of our neighbors are experiencing deep pain and suffering while we go about our business, often unaware that anything is amiss elsewhere. The work of justice will break our hearts. It takes more than thoughts and prayers. It takes actions and a willingness to work towards transforming the world. And it is founded on the idea that there is enough for all. Life is not a zero-sum game where enough for me has to mean not enough for you. God's abundant resources can provide all that is needed for the entire community to flourish. The trouble begins when we hoard our extras, or insist we alone earned what we have, or believe that some people just aren't worthy of having their basic needs met. Or, worst of all, imagine that the problem of others have nothing to do with us, and we have no responsibility to fix them. Jesus teaches us that the pain of others is indeed ours collectively to care about and respond to. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. For me, the key to doing justice, which as Cornell West points out, is what love looks like in public. The key to doing justice probably lies in following the other two parts of Micah's statement. We must also love kindness and walk humbly with God. To love kindness is to make it a priority to treat people with compassion because we never know what is happening to them. Jesus modeled this kind of freely offered concern for all to copy. We are not kind because someone has earned our kindness or because we think we will get something in return. We are kind because of who we are, beloved child of God and person of faith, and who we belong to, our creator. Jesus teaches us to love our neighbor. He draws attention to the meek and the poor, to those who mourn and those who hunger for righteousness, to the peacemakers and the pure in heart. All of those ones are worthy of God's deepest gifts of comfort, mercy, spiritual riches, and the kingdom of heaven. If Jesus believes these marginalized people are worthy of special attention from God, surely we too ought to pay them special attention. These days, kindness often seems to be dismissed as a weakness. People are kind, the thinking goes, because they cannot be discriminating enough in their observations of people to notice that this one is a freeloader, and that one is deceitful, and this one is a jerk, and that one is a liar. But being kind says far more about the one being kind than the one to whom the kindness is directed. Just as God offers salvation and forgiveness to all, regardless of our worthiness, we should offer kindness to all as a reflection of our own character as children of God and of our neighbor's value as a child of God too. To love kindness then, so often seen as a weakness, but really existing in God's world as a strength, is to be willing to extend grace, not insisting on our own rights in an angry way, but imagining what the other might be experiencing and desiring to bring them into an experience of abundance too. Being kind often costs us nothing and pays dividends that are priceless. To be kind is to see someone, really see them, in all their humanity of pain and joy, weakness and strength. It is to respond to that humanity whether they have met us with similar kindness or not. It is to offer compassion in the face of pain, companionship in the face of loneliness, grace in the face of sin. Of course, none of this is possible if we do not first and continually walk humbly with our God. Walking, of course, is not a static exercise. In walking, we move through the world, following pathways, taking in changing vistas, moving through situations and experiences. When we walk with God, we put God's priorities first, imagining how God hears and sees, listens and responds to a given situation or a person. We listen for God's heart, and we try to follow the Spirit's leading. To walk with is to be next to, to imply partnership, companionship, collaboration, give and take. When we walk together, we match our pace. 
We stop when one partner gets tired or falls. We skip with joy or trudge together as our life experiences dictate. To walk with is to move through life together, to exercise our bodies, to experience the physical and mental and emotional journey, to come to know each other in all our best and worst moments. When we walk together, we often talk, we exchange ideas, we brainstorm about solving problems or listen to each other's sorrows. Gazing ahead at what is to come, we remain aware of the one walking next to us, taking into account their pace and mood, their needs and contributions. To walk humbly is to remember that we are just as sinful as the next one, just as broken, just as in need of grace, and to accept that there is much we need to learn, much we need to improve, much we need to understand. To walk humbly with God is to be willing to be molded and shaped by God's priorities, confessing our mistakes and petty meannesses, striving to copy the way Jesus moved through the world, knowing that we will always be a work in progress in need of forgiveness and God's amazing grace. In a few minutes, we will gather to celebrate our past year and to look ahead to the new one. As we do so, perhaps we can consider what it might look like for us all to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. A year from now, as we prepare to celebrate 2023, what do we hope to have learned? Where and how do we hope to have grown? Who do we hope to have loved? Amen.
I guess we forgot the please stand for the affirmation of faith symbol. So please stand for the affirmation of faith. <laughs> we are sheep, are we not? When we don't see it in there, we don't know what to do. <laughs> Let us join together. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I do have, you may be seated. <laughs> I do have a few things to add to our list today. Paula Sousa's daughter, Jamie, is really ill with COVID. We lift her up. Ed Coons' friend, John Reitz, who um, is our carpet guy, who has given us many wonderful deals on our carpet, um, is having some health issues. And Cam Mosgraber's um, family friend, Jim Terhune, has been diagnosed with leukemia. Also, we remember Tyree Nichols and the whole community of Memphis. Let us pray together. Loving God, you cause rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Hear our prayers for your church and world, for the hungry and the overhead, overfed. May we have enough. For the mourners and the mockers, may we laugh together. For the victims and the oppressors, may we share power wisely. For the peacemakers and the warmongers, may clear truth and stern love lead us to harmony. For the silenced and the propagandists, may we speak our own words in truth. For the unemployed and the overworked, may our mark on this earth be kindly and creative. For the troubled and the secure, may we live together as wounded healers, for the homeless and the pampered. May our homes be simple, warm, and welcoming. For the vibrant and the dying, may we all die to sin and live to love. For those in our community who are suffering, especially all those affected by the mass shootings in California, for Tyree Nichols, his family, and the Memphis community, for Paula Sousa's daughter, Jamie, for John Reitz, for Jim Tarhoon, for Joseph Root, Rachel and Dan Reed, Jen Olson, Dan Butner Schertz's cousin, Brian, Roy Smith's grandparents, Hugh and Elaine Dudley. We lift up Jan, Jan Butner Schertz and her family on the recent death of her cousin, Betty, and similarly ask your love to surround Matt and Kelly Cox as they mourn the passing of Matt's grandmother. And we continue our prayers for Buzz Bauman, John Belt, Debbie Schnabel, Hannah Walker, Angelica Alvarez's brother EJ, Janice Bilalovic's niece Tiana, Peter and Irene Derry, Fran and Bob Perro's sister-in-law Patricia Withrow, Whit Beckett's brother Bob, Eric Paquin, Art Brooks, Julie Seide, Ms. Carol Brown, and Paul, Paula Sousa's sister-in-law, Maureen Monroe, and Robert Reynolds. May we participate in your work to bring them comfort, strength, and hope. For all those silent prayers of our hearts, which we will lift up to you. May we listen for your answering presence. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
I invite you now to stand. We will engage in our offering prayer together. As always, we thank you for your gifts of time and talent and treasure. If you have not yet filled out a pledge card and you would like to do so, we welcome that information as we continue to plan our year going forward. But let us now pray together. With what shall we come before the Lord this day? We come with a love of justice and a passion for sharing Christ's love. Let us walk in humble gratitude, offering to God a portion of the gifts that God freely shares with us, gifts for the healing of the world. Amen. And now go out into the world by way of our potluck lunch to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. And may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you and be with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.
Thank you.